Welcome to the party, pal. This is Fountainhead Forum 41. I have Brandon Jones, who is the uh, does the Be Dadly podcast. Uh, he is a passionate advocate of positive parenting and a certified parenting coach. Uh, he shares his expertise and insight of, of of being a father in today's world. And he has he has two sons who are what are their ages, Brandon? Seventeen and seven. 17 and seven and he's uh and you just have sons right yep okay and he's going to talk about navigating the waters of uh raising boys and helping them become good great men uh in today's world how are you brandon i'm doing well thank you chris thanks for having me okay brandon uh so what uh you know obviously you have and i think it helps when you have different age brackets like this what what first pick picked your interest in this you i because it seems like some, you know, I think a lot of parents are just kind of going through the motions, but obviously you really took a, put, put a lot of effort and study into this. Yes. So I'm over a decade in of intense study. Uh, I've attended a number of different courses. I've had parenting coaches. Um, I've spent over $100,000 in therapy, coaching, coursework, materials, um, and then becoming certified in this. And to be honest, it was not because I just came out, you know, I was like, I just want to be the best dad I can be. I always wanted to be the best dad I can be, but I thought it was just going to come naturally. I thought I would just be a great father. I would, I would have my kids. I would be intentional about it and be a great dad. Um, when my son was five years old, I got custody of him full time. And I, it became really apparent to me after a couple of years of him massively struggling with his behavior that I was not equipped to help my child have, uh, you know, give better, give better behavior. And what it was is that I was practicing the old school parenting techniques. I was practicing spanking, grounding, taking away privileges, yelling, shaming, et cetera. Uh, mostly out of just, I guess, repeating what my parents did with me, you know, kind of assuming that, don't break the status quo. Like, let's just stick with the program and, and do what our parents did. And unfortunately, uh, it wasn't working. And it was after a couple of years of, of really deploying this model of making my child feel bad to get him to do good that I was like, wow, this actually is not, it's a broken philosophy. And, um, one day my son cries and he says to me, dad, I'm sorry. I don't mean to make you angry. I don't mean to make my teachers angry. I'm just a bad kid. That day broke my heart and it made me realize, son, you're not a bad kid. Like you have habits, just like every single one of us, we all have stuff we're working on. You're working on some of your behavior habits, just like any one of us, but the inside of you is good. The inside of you, your heart, who you are, the being you are is good. And, uh, and I realized I needed to work on some of my messaging because, you know, saying something to a child, like, why can't you just understand? Or how many times have I told you, uh, you know, underneath the surface is like, how many times have I told you idiot, you know, or how many times have I, do I need to repeat myself dummy? You know what I mean? It has this, it has this tone in there. Um, or when we get, we correct our children through gritted teeth. You know, in a way, we're just telling them, like, I am so angry with you. You make me so mad. And then they associate that with, well, I'm, I guess I'm just bad. You know, I'm a bad kid. And and that just doesn't help get good behavior. And so I had to take a really hard look in the mirror and say, are my parenting tactics working? And And then I decided to just get really, really, really serious about learning how to be a better parent uh, for my child and get better behavior. And so that's kind of what started it. Honestly, it wasn't necessarily a desire. It was actually out of survival. I needed to figure out how to correct my child better. Yeah. Maybe there's, Oh geez, he's going to get bigger. Maybe some people, <laughs> exactly. you know, uh, I, I hope was, uh, did they put him on any drugs? I certainly hope not. Certainly tried to, uh, he was diagnosed yeah. with ADHD, uh, conduct disorder. Um, and the thing was, is that I, I didn't accept those diagnoses super quickly. First of all, they were given out pretty fast on the, on the ADHD side. So many people just wanted to call it ADHD. And, um, 
and yet I had spent time with him playing certain games, doing certain projects, and he would have great focus and he would, you know, he could totally manage his energy. And there were other times where he just, it didn't even seem like he was motivated to. And the conduct disorder uh, was a little bit of a better um, diagnosis in the sense that it helped me understand that he was, he had experienced some trauma and that trauma was influencing his, um, his behavior. And so when I started focusing on tra his trauma and healing that, when I started focusing on our relationship and the attachment style today, I'm very much a, a big proponent of connected parenting. I think connection has to be the foundation of your parenting. Um, and even when it comes to correction, you have to have connection in order to correct appropriately a child that's not connected with a parent or an adult or a caregiver of some type, it doesn't matter, you know, what you try to teach them. It doesn't matter how you try to parent them because it's kind of like the old saying goes, people don't care how much, you know, until they know how much you care. It's the same with our kids. They just need to know that we really, really do care. And that comes through quality time, connection, being there for them when they're struggling and, uh, and not coming down on them all the time. And, and it, it really makes a huge difference. You know, I, I think so much too, that, uh, attention is the currency yeah. and, and some, and, and some parents give more attention you know, when they're mad than they ever give their kids. Exactly. Yeah. It's actually, a, it's funny that something I learned along the way is that when you punish your child, you generally get super animated, right? So you're kind of busy, you're going about, you know, yourself and just kind of taking things, you know, as they come and then all of a sudden your child does something wrong. And now that they've triggered you, now you're in their face, you're animated, you're lecturing, you're taking and spending time with them in this way. That's yeah, albeit negative, but any time is better than no time at all. And what ends up happening is that the, the animation that we give in our face actually is a reinforcer because our bodies want engagement. And so when a child does something wrong and they find engagement with you, it can become addictive. They can actually get addicted to doing the wrong thing. My son was absolutely attention seeking, 100% attention seeking behaviors, nagging, interrupting, saying the wrong things, doing the wrong things on purpose, breaking things, acting rambunctious. It was all attention seeking. Underneath the surface, he was like saying, could somebody just spend some quality time with me? He just had no idea how to say it. Yeah. And and that's the problem. Kids don't know how to ask for what they need. And, and I think they're often, they're, they're often framing it in another way to get what they need. And, and, and of course you have to teach them maybe how to ask, you know, come out and ask for what they need. It's really, really hard to say though. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So it sounds like he's doing really well though now. Oh, he's doing great. And we have an amazing relationship these days. So um, I, it was it, such a big turning point was when I started to realize that so much of what he was trying to achieve was just a deep connection. Like he just wanted to feel connected and loved and safe and secure and all these things. But the way that it was coming out was in these super bizarre behaviors. Um, and when I started giving him more of what he wanted, he started to become more motivated to do better. And that was a big part of it. And the other thing was just learning how to communicate that um, when he does something wrong, it doesn't mean that I don't want him to be around me, which is yeah. something that previously was kind of like, dude, you have got, you have not listened to me all day. You need to get out of here, go to your room immediately. That's super common <laughs> uh, kind of language when it comes to parenting. And for me, I, what I've learned how to do is say something like, honey, I love you too much to fight like this. Or... Yeah. I love you and you and I need some space for a moment and let's talk about this as soon as we can speak respectfully. Stuff like that is like when you make sure that the relationship is what you put on the front end and you let them know that it's not that I don't want to be around you. It's that we need to return into respect or we need to return to, you know, safety or whatever it might be. And then once that ex that kind of need is met, because we all have a need for health, safety, respect, et cetera. Those are kind of my rules in the house is there's a threshold. And if we dip below the threshold, nothing can happen until restore that 
boundary. So if respect is dipped below, we just say, Hey, I love you. And I, I think and, and believe that you deserve respect. I also deserve respect. So until we can both return to respect, this conversation's over, but I promise you just as soon as you're ready, we can return to this conversation. So all we're doing is holding the boundary of respect. I do the same thing with health and I do the same thing with safety. Yeah. You know, it, you know, if your kid comes and said, you know, and yells at something then they could just say, ask me again, but in a calm voice, you know, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm ready and willing to hear you, but I'm not going to listen to it like that. If you can ask me in a calm voice, I'd be happy to continue the conversation. You can hold, that's the thing is you can hold boundaries while being respectful. Mm -hmm. I grew up where if a boundary is crossed, especially like respect, right? For, for men, it's very important to have respect, you know, yes, sir, no, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. And we kind of grew up that way in my house. Uh, you could get a spanking if you did not say yes, sir. And my grandparents were even more hardcore, especially my mom's side. I remember specifically that my, my grandmother, we were getting out of a truck. My grandmother asked me to do something. I did not say yes, ma'am. And my grandfather popped me in the mouth and said, you will say yes, ma'am to your grandmother. And I was like, I mean, I just, my eyes were just like, whoa, how did this just happen? And I felt so violated. I barely spent any time with them. And so for them, for him to feel, you know, like he had the boldness to just pop me right in the mouth for not saying something that in my house it was required, but we didn't really get popped in the mouth for it. You know, it was a, it was a pretty eye opening thing. And so for me, I definitely don't want to raise my children like that whatsoever. Um, but I found myself falling into those old patterns especially when you don't know another way, you know, you can start getting very frustrated with your child. You start seeing red that old, the old patterns will show up without you really even thinking about it. And pretty soon you're acting like your parents. Yeah. Cause it, it's not a job, you know, you never get a, a day off or even a minute off. I mean, it's, it's a, it's so you know, true. You know, and, th and that's one thing too, though. How do you, you know, as a father, how do you tell your, your son, your kids, Hey, I know you want to hang out, but I got to go do this job because I got to get a paycheck to pay the bills. And oh, yeah, they don't quite well, get that. And, you know, it's a that is a challenge. Yeah, it especially I remember during COVID, it was so hard to explain uh, to my little one, especially that I know daddy's home. Cause you know, before I was, I wasn't working at home. And so all of a sudden I'm in the home all the time. I know daddy's home. And generally we spend all time whenever daddy's home, we just, there's no barrier between you and me. But right now, like daddy has to focus. That was like really, really, really hard to explain to him. I think at the time too, he was like three or almost four. Um, and it was just, it was so challenging because it's like, if, if you're here, why can't I just talk to you? Why can't I just, you know, be with you all the time, you know, and it's just really, really difficult. We ended up hiring an au pair so that he had connection. Cause like the last thing we were both having to work and it was like, I can't just have him be alone. Like it's so hard to look at a four-year-old and watch him just try to entertain himself. How does how does you even expect that, you know, of this little bitty child to just be, be independent. <laughs> You're all four years old. Just do your own thing. And uh, so we hired an au pair and we did the numbers on it. And to have somebody, a babysitter or something come over, like a nanny come over or to have that kind of uh, opportunity throughout the week, it was like the same exact price. So we just hired a live-in au pair who spoke Spanish, taught him some Spanish, um, used to do event, you know, like little activities and stuff with them. And it was great. And they built a really strong connection. And that was, a, that was such a, a great way to do it, uh, for us during COVID. And, and I feel very privileged that we were able to, but, um, it doesn't cost as much as people think it, in my experience. Um, you do have to provide room and board, but it's not, it's not quite as much as most people, I think think it is did your younger son acquire a love of spanish after this i i hope so that is that is so that's so great yeah so he it was funny <laughs> going into kindergarten he he knew quite a bit of spanish uh and actually could read and identify words more easily in spanish than he could english so that actually came 
to kind of bite him a little bit because he was like, I don't understand why, you know, all these kids are already, you know, kind of ahead of him in terms of the English, but he was ahead in Spanish. Um, the funniest moment with the, uh, with the Spanish thing is one day, I mean, he was like four and I said, Oh honey, watch out there are ants. Cause I didn't want him to step in this ant pile. He looked at me and he says, no, hormiga. And I was like, what <laughs> did my four-year-old just correct me in Spanish? Like what in the world? And he's like calling the, you know, telling me that those, uh, those ants are called hormigas. And I'm like, I don't even know that word. <laughs> that's great. So, yeah, that's great. Yeah. It's uh, there's, there's some, it's so easy to do that now though. Yeah. And it's something though, you know, you, of course what you need to, you need to take him somewhere, you know, and where he, where he can use it. And then he'll, we're, we're often nowadays too, some parents will find a uh, Spanish speaking play part, play partners for their kids, you know, so the kids can play and they'll, and they'll do it with other kids, you know? Yeah. That's a great that's, idea. That, that is fantastic. Oh yeah. I, Definitely. You know, a, pra a practical piece, I would say you asked, you asked, how do you explain to your kid, you know, about between the work and like, Hey, I need to work, but I want to spend time with you. A practical piece that I found that's really interesting is that children, they're kind of like us where they like having a sense of when something could occur or, you know, having some set of expectations. So like, for example, my son, if I say, Hey honey, I've got a meeting right now, I've got a podcast, however, my podcast ends in one hour and I'll have a little 15 minute break. I would love to spend it with you. Yep. He will watch the clock and he actually knows how to tell when the next hour has rolled around and how to do that. <clears throat> with the timing. And it makes such a big difference. What's funny is it even makes a difference with him brushing his teeth. If I say I'm setting the two minute timer as opposed to him just having like, he doesn't know how long two minutes is whenever he has no sense of how long it will be. It feels like even though he's only brushed his teeth for 20 seconds, I'm like, no, no, no you got to keep going. But with no timer set, he just doesn't have any grasp on it. And it just feels like so long. Yeah. When I set the timer, he watches the timer. He likes watching the timer and he brushes his teeth without even questioning it. Yeah, I, I think that's, you know, that's good, too, though, when you set a time. And the thing is, you've got to stick to those times. Yes, it's true. Because it just I think it breaks the it really breaks the trust. I mean. Yes. Uh, as you know, there were so many things, you know, it, it got to a point where my dad would work late and he would say he'll be home at a certain time. And I would actually say, okay, dad said he'll be home at 10. So that means he'll be home at 11. Right. Right. I mean, right. It, it just got to that point. I should. Yeah. You, yeah. You know, holding, you know. holding that, making sure that you, um, <clears throat> you know that yeah. you can practice some integrity around that. That's huge. And I, what I do too is like, so that helps me because it sets expectations for him. I know in one hour I get to spend time with dad, these, uh, 10 minutes, this is what, this is another thing I figured out. 10 minutes is kind of the sweet spot of time where it doesn't, it's not so much that it feels like it interrupts your whole work day at all. Um, but it is enough to create a moment with the child and more than anything, it's really just about sharing a quick moment. You can share them in so many ways. And I love to ask my son, Hey bud, I've got 10 extra minutes. How would you like to spend it? I love to ask that question because then it kind of puts it in his hands. And obviously if he says something that I can't do like, Oh, in 10 minutes, I want to go to the lake. It's like, well, we can't, <laughs> the lake is pretty far. He already knows now that like 10 minutes will give us enough time. We go outside, we make a walk around the perimeter of our house and we flip over like the uh, water drains and stuff to see the beetles and the bugs. And we'll go over into this little side yard, the green belt area here and see if we can catch a quick lizard. And for him, that little adventure of just like going and seeking something with me, it just, it does it. And then the 10 minute timer goes up and I go, okay, honey, I got to get back to work. And he's like, okay, dad, I love you. Can I do this? And he'll ask me to do something. And then boom, I'm right back into work. It was a 10 minute break. It was huge for him. And it'll buy me, it literally will buy me a couple hours. That 10 yeah. minutes can actually buy a few hours of time. And it doesn't feel like it, it, it takes away from the whole day with him. Yeah. That, well, that's why, you know, a lot, you know, the, the coffee break is 10 minutes or the, you know, exactly. or the, you often see that happen. It seems to work out pretty well, you know, maybe even if it's just, you know, having a snack or teaching him a, you know, a Beatles song or something like that, you know, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, 
I, I, and yeah, and I think there is just that bond. They want to know that dad's there. It's, uh, you know, how do you, feel, Brandon, you know, I was, you know, I, I was born in, you know, I grew up in the 70s and 80s. Mm-hmm. And a lot of things have changed since then. And one of the things that really bothers me nowadays is so much more of this helicopter parenting. And we now live in a world where it doesn't seem like kids are allowed to do things that they used to be allowed to do. And if you try to Mm. let them do these things, somebody's going to call child protective services. I I remember being left in the car with the motor running and I've lived to tell the tale. How do you, I mean, I really don't know if I would ever want to have kids in this culture today. What, what do you say about that? You know, well, there's certainly, uh, the helicopter parenting and the re- constant rescuing, reminding, um, the micromanaging, small quarrels, micromanaging, you know, small um, behaviors. It's it's extremely prevalent. And what I think a lot of it is focused on, which is so interesting, is that we care more about what people think than how our child feels which is really interesting. So yeah. some of the micromanagement that I see happening with parents is I believe particularly happening because they're worried about what other people think. So I see yeah. people overcorrect children, especially when around others and they'll say, I'm sorry, he's, you know, whatever. And they, they're overcorrecting. Now fair, I will say, you know, there, there are a fair bit of times where you see somebody under correcting and they're not doing anything to their child that actually needs to be corrected. So that can happen as well. Um, but with the rescuing and reminding thing and the, the, this over parenting, what ends up happening is that actually it's subtly discouraging. It discourages the child from figuring it out on their own. It kind of undermines their their capabilities and their capacity for managing things. And there's a great saying, I think it's Rudolf Dreicher, who's got a lot of great, I mean, just great material on parenting, um, said that never do for a child what they can do for themselves. Yeah. And it's a really good rule of thumb because what ends up happening is that first your children, especially if they're used to you doing everything for them, they're at first resistant. I remember when my son was learning how to tie his shoes. The first several days, I want to even say a week, was just, it was just him whining. I don't want to try. I don't, you know, all that stuff. When he finally got it, you can't believe how many people he showed. (laughs) I mean, he just showed everybody. And that's how it is. There's always a bit of resistance as they grow into a new being and into these new capacities. But once they have them, they wouldn't trade them for anything. Oh yeah. My, my nephew was just two years old, but I remember he took a pen apart and put it back together. He was so proud of himself. Yeah. And then he said, now you do it. And of course I, I knew how to do it, but you know, I just went along with it. It's just, it, but course. you know, there's, there's also this thing about, you, you know, and sometimes you'll see it with kids, you know, you, you might see it with, ki- with, you know, kids in the, in the ghetto or someplace going out to a basketball court and playing basketball on their own. And sometimes, and you know, sometimes you'll hear of these, you know, guys in college who have never played organized basketball until they get to play college basketball. But you have a situation where the kids have learned to organize themselves right. and they've learned to set up a structure. Whereas as if you have, you know, organized sports, it's all about, you know, making these appeals to authority instead. And, and, and I wonder, you know, what, what's lost when, you know, it seems to me you lose a lot of empathy there because now it's just about making an appeal to whoever the, you know, who's ever in charge. Right. Yeah. One of the things that I've, I've, I've tried to adopt from different cultures, things that they do well when it comes to parenting and there's, as far as I understand, this is like an Asian thing. So we don't, we don't really do it that much in the West, but in most of Asia, People practice this. It's not like it's overtly said, at least that's not how it's been explained to me. It's more of just like, it's kind of like a code of conduct that nobody really talks about, right? Like it's the underlying rule that people don't really speak of, but it exists. And that is that children problems are children problems. (laughs) 
you know, and adult problems are adult problems. And so when children come to them with problems, it's like, go figure that out. <laughs> that is a child yeah. problem. And, you know, today, like we, we really get into everything. I mean, obviously if you want your child to improve certain skills or their safety involved, yes, you may need to get involved. But for the most part, a lot of the child quarrels, a lot of the, you know, he's not doing that or she's not doing, you know, all of those things. We've, we've kind of empowered our children to just come and complain to someone. Yeah. And what we haven't done is actually disempowering because it hasn't, it doesn't give them the skills to manage those kind of uh, conflicts on their own. And so what I do a lot of times is I say, I am so sorry, honey, uh, that you, that you, you seem really upset and I'm totally willing to talk to you about this. We'll have to talk about it later. I want you to go and see if you can manage on your own with multiple kids. If there's like a, um, a toy or something that they're fighting over, I'll just say, Hey guys, either you guys learn and figure out how you can share this, whether that's taking turns, uh, time limits, whatever it might be, you guys figure out how you can share this or that toy is going to go in timeout for 20 minutes and everyone will lose it. So what do you guys want to do? Yeah. And then instead of putting any one child in timeout, I really believe you should put the toy in timeout. I just take the toy and put it on a shelf or take the toy and put it somewhere. And I say that toy is going in timeout for 20 minutes. It allows the children to do something else. It also teaches them that if we bring another toy and we start fighting over it, he's going to put that toy in timeout. So we better figure this out. So it gives them a second chance. And then when the 20 minute timer goes out, I reintroduce the toy back to the group. That, that works so well and it helps children go, okay, there's a really serious boundary. We probably shouldn't be fighting and bringing this back to Brandon because he'll put our toy in timeout. And number two, it actually teaches them that we have to figure out how to organize ourselves because this is something that we need to be able to do together and make this work. And, um, and so that, that seems to work really well. And, and then later, whenever I talk to my child later, I say, hey, buddy, I remember today whenever you were playing with so-and-so that you were struggling with a little conflict resolution. And it seems like you could use some help uh, learning how to identify someone else's emotions, put yourself in their shoes, and communicate a plan. Can we talk about that? And then what's great is that since we're away from the ordeal and his emotions aren't high, it's way easier to give him a lesson on how to do all of that. Yeah, certainly is that that's that's really great. Yeah, Le learning how to teach boys to manage their emotions, I think, is hard without because I think we 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 it's almost as if we just we try to just tell boys not to have emotions at all, which I don't think is helpful. But mm -mm. boys have these emotions that sometimes you know just let them out, you know, and 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 sometimes you just have to figure out a way to let them out. I mean, I, I you know, I had a I had a friend die last july and and when i heard the news i immediately went down to gold's gym and just beat up a punching bag for an, a, a half hour mm -hmm. that was just you know a way to deal with it it's right you know but just i, I wanted to hit something but you, you know go hit something and, and make it so it's not destructive you know exactly you yeah might, it's you, know, you might teach your boys to just okay go beat up that pillow you know or some, mm -hmm. something like that you know or, well, and it's, it's, yeah. you're, you're, you're so right about the emotions. There's speaking of these codes of conduct or these things that we don't really speak about overtly, but they're certainly there, you know, girls aren't allowed to express anger, but they're allowed to express sadness. Guys are allowed to express anger, but they're not allowed to express sadness. And so there's a lot of mixed up messages that kids get. We've gotten, you know, certainly you and I had growing up, we received a message that you yeah. can't be sad, but you can certainly be mad. And all the women in our life received, you can't be mad, but you can certainly be sad, you know? And, um, and so what I do, and I think this is really, really, really important. And it works extremely well for, for all people. It really works well for all, all people because it's a human centric idea. Um, it doesn't necessarily, it's not just for one sex or another, although I will say that women respond to it amazingly. And uh, so do young girls that are highly emotional. They respond to this really well. Um, but of course, boys and men benefit as well. So this is what it is. It's you, you are going to identify three emotions 
that are behind something that you're seeing someone display. Let's say a, ch a child is really, really, really angry. I mean, they are just red angry. Uh, instead of just saying, you seem angry, which is great. That's good. A good start. But let's take it further. What we want to do is we want to say, man, it looks like you're angry. Now we're going to start going for three emotions. Is it because you're really frustrated with what's going on? And maybe that because you had lost that toy, you're now disappointed. There's two. And, and you were, and you worry, there's three that you will never get that toy back again. Is that what's going on? Yeah. Man, if you can nail three emotions, the child goes, that's it. And then once they feel understood, it's the old Stephen Covey model, seek first to understand and then to be understood. Once they have been understood, their 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 prefrontal cortex comes back online, kind of comes back into the, the picture, and then they are more open to hearing a solution, an idea, an alternative, um, or even just saying, I'm, I'm super sorry you feel that way, hon. And you could just basically just leave it at that. But what's great is when you do that, you actually raise their emotional intelligence because we already know kids intelligence can be improved by increasing their vocabulary. Well, their emotional intelligence can be improved by increasing their emotional vocabulary, giving them more words to describe anger, sadness, joy, et cetera, can actually help them, um, become better communicators about what they're feeling and how, what, how things are going on. So, and, and everybody likes to feel heard and understood. Um, so it works with everyone, but it's a, it's a very powerful tool. Certainly, you know, uh, you know, now in this, you know, more modern day and age, I mean, you, you know, you grew up a while ago. I, I grew up at a time, you know, where the first time I saw dirty pictures was in a magazine. Yep. So, Nowadays, the kids are seeing dirty pictures uh, almost any time they probably want to get them. Mm -hmm. What do you, how do you, how have you dealt with that as a dad? I mean, uh, so with your kids. Well, and it's, it's interesting, like even, so my, you know, my 17 year old, um, we had, so I don't know if, are you familiar with like the scale of consciousness? No, I've not heard of that. Okay. So uh, David Hawkins created the scale of consciousness. Scale of consciousness has, um, it goes from shame and guilt down at the bottom. It raises up to love, which is the highest frequency. It also is color coordinated. Love is at violet, uh, shame, guilt, and stuff like that is down at red. And it, what it does is it, it's, it's, it's very, it's a very interesting um, chart. All emotions have some. I'm going to say all emotions have some function and, and yet, uh, some emotions take energy. David Hawkins recognized that there are certain emotions that take energy. There are certain emotions that give energy. So there's a point at which, uh, energy is received from an emotion and the other point where it's taken. So neutrality is right at the turning point. So we start to gain we start to gain energy right there at neutrality. And it kind of, as you continue to go up through, um, love, courage, you know, all these different things, you start to gain, uh, energy when you're down in anger, shame, guilt, pride, all of these other, uh, other things, they actually take a lot of energy. They take a, a, a certain degree of, of, uh, energy from you. Um, so what, one of the conversations that my oldest son and I had was about pornography and how it relates to the sexual experience that we think of sexual experiences. If, if you were to go off the pornography thing, it's almost abuse. It's like abusive. Um, it's random. It's with random people. Uh, it's extremely, there's, there's like just kind of a grotesque version of sexuality, right? And I told my son, I said that there's a whole nother side, which you will never see on a pornography scene. You're never going to see it. There's, there's almost no way to capture it on a camera because it's, it's something that is more intimate and it, it is, is something that comes from the heart and, and kind of permeates every cell of your being outward. It's not from your head or from this head. It's from your heart. 
And uh, I told him, I said, I want you to experience that in your life. But I can tell you that here's the problem. If you brainwash yourself with pornography, it's very hard to get up those levels. Because every time you think of sex, you're down in the levels that take your energy. They do not have this, they don't have this frequency that, that you can tap into, um, these higher frequencies. And so we had that talk and, and we've had it now several times. Uh, and my son, he has become over the years, an extremely traditional, uh, individual. He doesn't want to have multiple girlfriends. He only wants to have one girlfriend. He doesn't like polyamory. He thinks it's strange. Um, and, and by the way, I'm just telling you, I, I didn't even, I I'm not influencing him in these ways. He's, he's told, he's come to me and told me, I want a traditional relationship. I said, what does that mean? He said, I really believe a man and a woman who have like a really strong relationship that there's like nothing more powerful than that. But I don't believe that that works if you're trying to have like just date anyone or have multiple partners or anything like that. He's like, I think it takes away from the power that you can get from a, a, a great relationship. And I'm like, okay. And then he's like, and I really like you know, want, I want to have a wife with traditional values. Like I want to, that's what I really want. And I'm like, okay. And now he's been dating a girl for a, 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 quite a long time. Um, and they're extremely sweet and supportive of each other and they want the best for one another. And they really kind of try to help, help each other out from school grades to what peers are influencing them, et cetera. And, I really believe it. It's partly it's partly because of our conversations about what relationships can be versus what we're seeing sold on the mainstream media. A relationship can be and should be, and um, and so while while it is more conventional, one of the things that he believes within that conventional dynamic is that you shouldn't watch pornography because it would be like cheating on your partner. And so he chooses to not do pornography because he has a girlfriend. Wow. That is, that's wild. Yeah. It sounds like he's really, um, you know, does he have uh, curious to know he, he's said he's been committed for a while. Does he get a lot of other opportunities or does he not? Or do you know? Oh, in terms of other, other women. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he's, he's an extremely handsome young man and he has mentioned to me, people send him, um, he's not been using this app as much lately, but he used to use Snapchat and that he would get private snap invitations from girls from his school that figured out his handle and they would be sending him, you know, they're trying to add him as a Snapchat and stuff like that. And he would ignore them and he would say, dad, it's so weird. Like girls are they're just so weird. They just don't seem to care. And obviously we have, then we have to talk about son. When you say girls don't seem to care, you got to be careful because all girls, what about Avery? Yeah. And he's like, Oh no, not her. I'm like, right. It's very important how you use your language. You cannot say girls don't care, you know, and we talk about how important it is. I don't try to word police them because I think that's not good, but I do try to make sure more from like a cognitive behavioral therapy style and that, you know, if you frame up something, then it has certain, you know, um, results in your consciousness. So if you say girls are weird, well, now you've kind of made this absolute statement, yep. which is absolutely wrong. <laughs> so we work on, we work yeah. on stuff like that. Or say some girls are weird, you know, which uh, yeah. leaves it open ended. Yeah, you know that's another thing too, though. I think with your language, you know, is it, it's important. I, I think with kids, not to use B verbs. Mm, tell me uh, about that. Well, well, for example, don't say you're smart. Say you did a good job. That's right. Absolutely. Yes, because, I one hundred percent. Because you know, just like that. you said, when your son said, "I'm just a bad kid." he's already making that his identity and, and you just say, no, you're just a kid who made a mistake. It's, it's, it's better to say, you know, I made a mistake than to say I am a mistake. 100%. Yes. That's exactly the distinction that was so important to me. The moment he said that you are not a bad kid. There are behaviors you have that have negative consequences. Um, yes. So we, so 
the focusing on the effort and the process is so much more empowering and encouraging to children than focusing on the doer and the outcome. And when you say you're a smart kid, well, that's the, the, the doer and it's the outcome of whatever, or that was, you know, it could be, there's all kinds of things like, um, that are basically labels. You're labeling this individual, um, as opposed to labeling the effort or the, uh, you know, the work that they're doing or the, or the thinking that they put or involved or the, um, perseverance that they did demonstrated, those are way more powerful. And actually you get more of that. So if I say, for example, man, you must've worked really hard. I'm going to get more hard work. If I say you did a good job and a lot of parents do this and it, we don't even do it on purpose. We think we're being sweet, but if you ever had a child bring you a drawing and they bring you this random drawing, it's for you. And of course you're like, I love it. Right. Um, but what is it? <laughs> no, but you're like, I love it. This is a great job. You're such an artist. Okay. So yeah. that, that happens. Um, and sometimes the child didn't really try and they don't even know what they just wanted to give you something. Right. And so then you, you label it as, man, this is such a great job. You are so good. You're such a sweet boy or you're such a good girl. Um, what's interesting is that if the child didn't think they tried and they didn't really do much, and I've seen kids do this, they give somebody a scribble, they act like they're really impressed. Then the child goes and gives scri just scribbles and gives everybody scribbles. And what they don't realize, like the child's not trying at all. They just wanted to give you something. And because you labeled it as good, now they think that that's what they should do. And if you say, well, this is a great question and kids love this question, by the way, and it absolutely will help you know whether or not the child, what the child thinks, because see, we're associating what we believed about it. But what's even more powerful is to say something along the lines, and this is the one I love to use is, wow, show me how you did that. And then they're like, oh, this is what I did. I did this right here and I did that. And I'm like, and, and what do you think about that? Do you, does that, is that hard or is, is that easy? And they're like, uh, it's kind of easy. I'm like, oh, okay. It's kind of easy. And, um, and why did you want to give it to me? Because I care about you. Oh, that's so sweet. I care about you too. Can I get a hug and get a hug? Never did I say that was a really good job. And you were, you know, cause I, to them, they were like, eh, it was just this. And I just did that. And it wasn't really that big of a deal. I just care about you. Well, I care about you too. That's awesome. You know, but I'm not going to label it as that's an amazing job. And you're an artist when the child's like, I didn't really do anything, which happens a lot. <laughs> it's just a yeah. different approach. That's a very, yeah, it's a very different approach. I mean, definitely it's a, uh, you know, uh, so your, your oldest is 17 now you said, mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what, we'll be 18 this year. Oh, wow. Crazy. Yeah. That's a, uh, yeah. So what do you, what do you think you've learned about, what do you think you else do you think you've learned during all this? I'd say the most important things that I've learned, uh, going back to the beginning where I was saying that my, my philosophy was that I had to make my children feel bad to get them to do good. Yeah. Uh, I learned that that's not true. <laughs> that's probably one of the most important things. I learned that from Jane Nelson and positive discipline. And what I, when I was trying to practice that pain, shame, blame model, where I was trying to make my child feel bad enough to get them to do good. Um, it wasn't working. It was actually destroying them from, from him. It was destroying him from the inside out. It was breaking down his, uh, confidence. And it was also tearing apart our relationship and it was breaking and severing our attachment because there were days where he was having a hard day at school and now he gets home and the person that could be supportive and empathetic, help open him up is now chewing him out and punishing him. And so it just was, it's like pouring fuel on a fire. You're just not yeah. getting what you really want. And, uh, and so for me, the big eye opener was, um, if I develop a very strong attachment with my child. If when he has a hard day, I actually give him warmth and space and ask him to come to me and open up 
unpack things, ask him what he really wants in his life, give him proper attention and love and care. He's going to go back and try harder. You're going to get more cooperation, more willingness, more of this stuff. If you actually work on the inside, the heart, there are other things I learned along the way that were, you know, that that's very important. I just want to say, I don't even want to just skip over that. That is probably the most important thing to me is connection must exceed correction. That's the best way I can say it. If you correct more often than you connect, you will have problems. I don't care if that's your spouse, your subordinates at work. If you are correcting someone more often than you are connecting with them, you will experience problems. And that's absolutely true in your parenting. Uh, how does, uh, how, how do the two boys get along? I mean, obviously there's a difference, but yeah. Uh, the old, the, the younger one adores his older brother. Like you cannot believe he's always like, he says the, the sweetest things. It just, I mean, it literally their heart melting. He goes, Sheldon, how are you so cool? <laughs> yeah. Just so you're just like, Oh, he goes, yeah. uh, shall he'll say, Sheldon, one day I want to grow up like you. Yeah. I mean, just sweet stuff. And, and Sheldon yeah. is a very caring older brother. He does, he does a lot of sweet things with his little brother and teaches them stuff. It's really yeah. cute. How, you know, what they, how do you deal with it also, you know, when, you know, especially with teenagers that you're, you know, your son looks like he's hanging around with the wrong crowd. What, what mm. have you had situations like that? And what do you do? Oh, 100%. So, uh, there was a, a point at which Sheldon, a video came across something. I don't know if it was TikTok, it was something on one of his pages. And I saw it and another family member saw it. They tagged me and said, you know, hey, do you see this? And he and some other kids were vandalizing um, property. They were throwing stuff off of a uh, parking garage. Okay. Now I get it as a guy. Seeing stuff break is awesome. You know, like wanting to explode stuff, whatever. Yeah. It's awesome. But there's also a point at yeah. which we're violating some laws when we're just throwing things off, yeah. uh, off of this parking garage. And it could be dangerous if anyone's walking underneath, et cetera. And yeah. so him and I had to have a very strong talk about, you know, the choices we make, the kind of privileges we could lose. And I'm not just talking about at, at home. I mean, like at that place, that location where he's at, does he ever want to go there again? Cause it could easily be, they say, you can't come here. You're not allowed to be on this property ever again. If we see you here, you're going to be arrested. Right. Yeah. So anyways, him and I had to have the strong talk and I, and I, when we talked to us, what do you believe was the biggest influence to that behavior? Because I would like to understand, like, let's go to the source of what causes that behavior. And it's like, well, partly because I'm a teenager and I want to just do wild stuff. Okay. That's, that's good to know. Right. There's definitely some of that that's in there. What else? He's like, well, there's this one guy. He's like one of my friends. But he, every time we're around each other, we just rile each other up to the point where we do bad things. Aha. OK. And so, you know, we, we, what do you want to do with that energy, that wild energy that you have inside of you? And he's like, I kind of think I want to get a dirt bike. Uh, I kind of think I want to. He's like, think of how to channel it. How could I channel that energy into wild experiences that are not necessarily uh, vandalism. Right. Um, and so we talked about a number of things. It turned out that he ended up working out, that that's his new thing. He likes to work yeah. out. He likes exercise. Um, the friend with, it took one more event. I think it was just one more, one more event with that kid. And I said, son, you got a choice to make. You can either continue to lose privileges, to lose experiences, to miss out on things, to have risk, greater than you could bear, right? Writing checks your, yeah. your butt can't afford, or you say goodbye to this friend and you, you just basically draw a hard line. And I said, I'm going to ask you, which are you going to choose? Because I'm telling you, you already have enough examples here right now. You know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. You are in that moment where anything from this point forward would be a shame on you. And he, uh, he chose to, uh, in the friendship and it was so much better. And within, you know, him and I check in every week, we have a check in every week. How are you doing on this? How are you doing on that? We kind of go through this thing one on a scale of one to 10. And I just coach him as a, as I'm like his parent, 
but I'm also his coach. And we just talk about things he wants to improve. And uh, the next week we talked about it and he's like, yeah, dad, already my like everything is like better. Like he's like, yeah. I'm doing way better. Do uh, does Sheldon's friends uh, say, I wish you were my dad? Oh, for sure. Yeah, we have a lot of there's a lot of sweet uh, times. Yeah. And a, funny enough, a lot of my uh, a lot of my friends and even followers on yeah. Facebook, I get that they're like, dude, I wish my dad had taken the time to learn this stuff and do what you're doing. Yeah. Does it even happen sometimes that they'd come to you with something before they'd go to their own parents? I mean, you know. That's a great question. I haven't had that uh, yeah. occur yet, um, but yeah, certainly one of the things I, I have such a heart for kids. Uh, I really, especially kids that are missing a dad, man. Yeah. I sometimes think about adopting. I just can't, it just breaks my heart to think about kids that don't have a dad. Oh yeah. It's terrible. You know, I, and Brandon, doesn't it seem like we have, we live in a culture that's become hostile to dads? Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons that I started Be Dadly is that there's a lot of parenting courses, materials out there, and no one does it overtly or means to, I think. I mean, certainly there are some, but for the most part, like it's, it's marketed and sold mainly to women. It's like mothers are the primary yeah. candidate. And I wanted to give guys a space to talk about their anger, their impatience, their uh some of these things that you know given a certain class or a certain environment you're not really going to open up that much about but with the guys like when we're talking we can totally open up with each other and that's something that i always wanted for myself and i, I wanted to create that for dads out there today so that we can do the deep work and we can basically do the fatherhood work that we need to um and give them a real outlet you know i remember one time I was at this, I think I was helping, helping some political people, but I heard this guy start talking about his son and he just, and his son was, you know, a teen, you know, in his late teens and just said something like, started complaining and said, my son's a piece of shit. And after a while, I just wanted to say, maybe you're a piece of shit too. Yeah, exactly. Do you, do you ever have a moment like that where you just want to berate these guys for the way they're talking about their sons? Uh, I, ha I haven't, uh, but I haven't, it, it, certainly if I had heard that, I probably would think the exact same thing as you. Um, I have seen a lot of guys, believe it or not, that say, you know, I, and this is where they get to the go, you know, when I ask them, what are your parenting challenges? Oh man, yeah. to be honest, my kids are pretty good. The truth is, is that I'm the challenge. Yeah. I've seen that a lot. Guys take on that burden and I, I really commend, commend them and respect them for that because uh, so much of the parenting challenge that I've learned, it is so much of our challenge. Certainly you could blame your kids, you could label your kids a bad kid or whatever, but the real truth is that there's only one person gets to control uh, you and how those outcomes happen for you, for you and that's yourself. So you have to take some accountability and authority um, in your parenting experience. And if you want a new outcome, you got to be willing to put in new inputs. So. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, well, you have anything else you want to say before we go? This has been a great talk. Thank you. No, I'm super appreciative for you, uh, having me on. I would just say the, the last thing is if you're a parent, you're listening to stuff like this, you're looking for ways to, um, improve your parenting, then you're a great parent. There are plenty of people out there who believe they've got it all figured out and the world should bend to them. Their kids need to bend the knee. And that's the way that they, you know, it has nothing to do with them, has everything to do with their kids. Um, but then there are people like you who are listening to this stuff, who are looking to learn, to grow, to improve yourself. And I can tell you that uh, you model for your children by doing this kind of stuff. You model for them what it looks like to do the work. And I will tell you that in my experience, doing the work for your family, for your children, for that relationship, it means so much to them. It will mean so much to you. And you can look back without regrets. If you want to in, in, um, increase the speed at which uh, you uh, improve your parenting, I would encourage you to go to my website. Uh, we have a quiz on there you can take to, uh, that will help you know which kind of 
parent you are in terms of uh, your disposition and how it's impacting your parenting. There's also uh, tips and strategies and there's all kinds of resources on there. We have a blog on there as well. And uh, yeah, we'd love to have you over there. Just go to www.bedadly.com. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, Brandon. It's been great talking to you and good luck. It sounds like you're doing a lot of great stuff. So no, I appreciate it. Um, please hit like and subs- please like the video, subscribe to my channel and go buy my novel. I'm Chris Baker. I'm Escape from the Village. Uh, I've been talking to Brandon Jones and we are out.